I have sinned against you, my Lord. Well, I wouldn't go that far, Jimmy, but I was remiss in last week's Joyce Meyer video by not providing some scripture references to back up my position on the conscious continuation of the soul of a person when they die. One of the benefits of having done so many videos over the years, I think I'm pushing upwards of 700, there's a decent chance that there's a video already in the can that addresses my view on a particular subject. And such is the case in this situation. And here's a quick YouTube tip if you're not aware of it. Within each channel, there's a search feature. Just click on the magnifying glass right here and search for something you're interested in. And oh, there's one more issue that I did not have time to explain in the Joyce Meyer video that came up in the comments. I'll post a link in the video info section that addresses that as well. It begins like this. But you got to understand that you are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. And your spirit got born again. So I hope these additional videos will clarify my position on these subjects, which, although not salvific, are important in my opinion. And as always, as we read in Proverbs 27, 17, allow iron to sharpen iron. Hello, Bezel Triple Three here. I'd like to discuss the intermediate state, that period of time between a person's death and the second coming of Christ or the end of the world. I want to talk about soul sleep and whether or not it is a biblical concept. I've been talking about it with a fella in my Bible study, some interesting conversations, so I want to share some of what I've uh, looked at and learned with you. Now, a couple things about soul sleep that I've recently discovered. I did not know this, but the people that hold to the teaching of soul sleep actually believe that when you die, uh, your soul, which they believe is a life force, an impersonal life force, goes back to God. It was like the breath of God that was put in Adam. It was kind of a, a life, a generic life force. And when you die, that life force is removed from you and you are now in the grave. Uh, and you basically don't exist. You do not exist until the resurrection, which in effect is a recreation. Kind of amazing, isn't it? Um, so I want to look at some passages, and we'll have to get off the bike and uh, refer to them. I don't have them with me right now. But uh, let's take a look at the passages that they would use and the passages I want to use to, uh, to contend for a conscious, personal identity after the soul separates from the body. Now, to get started, let's look at some passages that a psychophonician, that is, a person who believes in soul sleep, would use to try to make their case. By the way, it's interesting to know that the only two groups that believe in this teaching of soul sleep are the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, now, they'll begin by going to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, and God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul, or sometimes it's uh, translated creature. Um, they will say that this man, Adam, was given this non-personal breath or spirit, small s, from God. And that when death occurs, this spirit or life force is removed from the person and the spirit goes, this non-personal spirit goes back to God. Here go another verse that they use in, Ecclesi uh, in Ecclesiastes 12, the dust returns to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Sounds plausible, I guess, but let's go on. Uh, they'll take other Old Testament uh, verses to try to make the point that when you're dead, you can't do anything. You're asleep, you're unconscious, and nothing's happening. Uh, they'll go to Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead don't know anything, uh, nor they have any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Or Psalm 115, 17. Uh, for the dead do not praise God, nor does anyone who, do, who goes down into silence. Uh, there are many more, but they're all saying the same thing. When you're dead, you can't do anything. And on that point, I would agree. But we need to understand from what viewpoint these verses are to be understood. These verses are describing one who has died from the viewpoint of the living, you see, not as they actually are, but as they appear from the viewpoint of the living. 
Now, to be sure, the body does sleep in the grave, if you will, as it waits for the general resurrection, but the soul, which neither dies nor sleeps, transitions immediately into one place or the other. As we're told in Hebrews chapter 9, inasmuch as it is appointed for man to die once, and then comes judgment. Now, in opposition to this teaching of soul sleep, I want to make the case that the soul or spirit, same thing, of a person continues to exist when it is separated from the body at death. You see, the Bible has much to say about the state of the soul when a person dies. So let's go to the passages that make the case for a continued conscious existence of the soul at the moment of death. The first place we need to go is uh, in Matthew 17, where we see Jesus taking the three of his closest disciples to the Mount of Transfiguration. Here Jesus reveals a glimpse of his glory to his disciples, and all of a sudden they are visited by two other people, Elijah and Moses. They're identifiable. Um, Elijah, we know, if you, if you look at the story, he never died. He was taken directly to heaven. But Moses did die and was buried. And yet, Moses appears and has a conversation with Jesus Christ. There is evidence right there of the continued conscious existence of at least a soul in some type of a, a form that's identifiable after death. How about Luke 23? We have Jesus hanging on the cross and the one thief who sees who Jesus actually is and asks that he be remembered when Jesus enters into his kingdom. Jesus replies to him, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now the soul sleep person will say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you need to move a comma over so it reads, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. That grammatically just doesn't make any sense, uh, that Jesus would be so um, uh, um, interested in saying, I I'm not telling you yesterday and I'm not telling you tomorrow, I'm telling you today uh, at the resurrection you'll be with me in paradise. That just doesn't wash. Um, how about 2 Corinthians 5, a very interesting passage. Paul speaks about the intermediate state or that time between the first, I should say, the, our death and the second coming of Christ. He talks about an earthly tent, which means our bodies. And he says, if this earthly tent is destroyed, we will be given a building from God or a dwelling place. Remember, Jesus talked about, in, his fa in my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places. Well, uh, Paul is talking about this, and he goes on to say uh, that we, we want to be not uh, naked, but clothed. So somehow he's talking about the fact that the, the soul who goes into the presence of God is given some type of a temporary body or a dwelling place uh, for the soul until the final resurrection where the soul will be reunited with the body. Uh, Philippians 1.21 is a great passage to go to. Uh, Paul writes, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain or even better. Uh, if I am to go on living in the body, well, this will mean fruitful labor for me, you know, be able to continue to share the gospel. He says, but what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. A desire to depart and be with Christ, is far, uh, which, which would be far better, right? Now, it's important to see that uh, there is no mention of the resurrection in this passage. And also, if Paul had only a, uh, an idea of a temporary non-existence between his death and the resurrection, what would there be to look forward to in that? Wouldn't he much rather stay in this life to be able to preach the gospel than to go into some type of non-existence until the resurrection of the dead? Now, two points I want to leave with you. The first is the idea of resurrection is always connected with the body not the soul. The soul is the immaterial part of who you are. You will never cease being you. Now, you will be without your body for a time after you die, but God will one day unite both your soul and your body in the general resurrection. If you're a Christian, your soul gets glorified the moment you die, and then at the general resurrection, both body and soul will be glorified and fit for heaven. Second, 
The soul at death immediately goes to one of two places. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 helps us see that. Now, although it's a parable and not a true story, like other parables of Jesus, it speaks of real life and things that really happen. So take the, the, uh, the story of the rich man and Lazarus and translate it into the reality of what happens on the other side of this life. Finally, let me refer you to a biblical, uh, a biblical description of the state of man after death. It's from the Westminster Confession, chapter 32. The bodies of men after death return to dust and see corruption. But their souls, which neither die nor sleep, having an immortal subsistence, immediately return to God who gave them. The souls of the righteous, being then made perfect in holiness, are received into the highest heavens where they behold the face of God in light and glory, awaiting for the full redemption of their bodies. And the souls of the wicked are cast into hell, where they remain in torments and utter darkness, reserved to the judgment of that great day. Besides these two places for souls separated from their bodies, the scripture acknowledges none. 